Good morning, everyone. Uh, you may wonder what someone from the frozen north like me is doing down here in California in the first place, and secondly, why should I be talking about the California? California what are we doing? Um, well, I think two seconds of history. I came to a club a very, very long time ago, just in time to catch Ian Buckle when he was first in the University of California as well. So uh, we've known each other for quite some time, and maybe that takes so place. Well, I'd like to talk today about the California High Speed Rail system, uh, except that as you will see, there's been a kind of change of direction along the way. I'd like also to acknowledge my co-authors, and Michelle Chang, who is the student doing the work. Can people hear at the back? I'm wondering if the microphone is on. Can people hear at the back? Mike, 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 Maybe without the light. Just don't touch the fly board, please. This thing is not steady. Okay. I'll just talk a bit about that. In terms of my kid. Um, to start with, the, the California high speed rail system uh, looks fairly exotic from the outside. And on the surface of it, it looks for a wonderful opportunity to do some performance based earthwork engineering. We've got some very stringent uh, operational requirements and expectations. Uh, there's a pretty heavy seismic hazard along at least part of the route. Uh, huge budget, and therefore you think there's room to do some interesting stuff. Um, and there should be room for some standardization of systems because there will be many bridges along the way. And of course, an uh, enthusiastic partner to get things right, the High Speed Rail Authority. Um, we also had a project with the FIU, the Florida International University ABC Center, and ABC, for those of you not who know, is Accelerated Bridge Construction, uh, because they were interested in applying ABC systems to the high-speed rail uh, system, and so we had a little bit of money from them, and we were trying to look at some of the prefabrication possibilities uh, and various different things associated with that. Now, one of the things that we found fairly quickly when we got into it uh, was that on the superstructure, there are some fairly limited possibilities of what you can do. And most of the reason is there are very, very stringent deflection and vibration limits. And what we see here is uh, on the vertical axis is the L to D ratio. If you turn up the other way, that would be a deflection divided by the span length. So highway bridges are typically running about 1 in 800 is a typical vertical deflection limit for under live load. And 1 in 800 is pretty tough compared to what you get in buildings. In the high-speed rail, they're looking at about 1 in 3,000. So they're about four times more stringent <coughs> than a typical highway bridge. So what that means is you need a very, very stiff superstructure. And we're referring here to static deflections. This reflects over into <coughs> dynamic deflections in terms of vibration as well. But the bottom line is you need a super stiff superstructure. So where that takes you, is that you need um, a span to depth ratio, which is what you see the L to H, distinguish here between a span of a depth and a deflection of a span. The deflection of a span we just looked at is one in a thousand, uh, one in three thousand rather, and you get that by having a very deep superstructure compared to a span. And this is a plot uh, showing what you would need if you have a fairly typical box scale for different spans. And it turns out on these different spans, you're looking at for simple spans, something on the order of, of 10, 11, 12 to 1 span to depth. That's a very deep girder compared to typical highway girders. Typical highway girders, you're looking at maybe 20, 25 to 1, that kind of ratio. And so they are a lot more skinny than these guys. Put another way, these guys are going to be very deep, very big, and very heavy. So what this really means is the superstructures are going to be controlled by the, the service load criteria which dictate these very deep girders. That in turn means that a very deep girder is very heavy. If it's very heavy, it's going to be very difficult to truck it to the site that you need if you want to precast it. And therefore, precasting using conventional ideas of precasting in a precast producer's shop is going to be almost impossible, partly because in the, in the <coughs> producer's fabrication plant, they have difficulty handling something that heavy. And then if you get something which weighs something on the order of three or four hundred thousand pounds on the road, then you can't take it anywhere. It's just too heavy. You break all the bridges that you drive. So what that really means is 
that you're looking at a couple of different techniques. Either cast and trace, which you can deal with from a weight point of view, or you're looking at something called full span free casting, which has been done fairly extensively in China. And this we should take note of because the Chinese have built something like 3,000 kilometers of uh, high-speed rail, whereas no one else has built anywhere near that amount. You have Japan, they go in France, in Germany, uh, Spain, they all have relatively small amounts. But the Chinese are ahead by a factor of something like 10 in terms of what they've built. A lot of what they've built has been using this full span precasting, which means that you precast whole spans, you build a giant erection gantry, and you take them along with that, and then you can pop spans in one every 20 minutes or something, one after the other. It's amazing how quickly you can do it. Um, however, that requires a very large amount of capital, a lot of planning. You've got to make sure that all of your spans are going to be sufficiently similar that your erection equipment can work it, and therefore um, this does require a lot of planning, a lot of centralization, and a lot of capital in the first place. And so what, what happened in California was that they decided to go with a relatively large number of design-build contracts. And so the contracting method has meant that you, the, the High Speed Rail Authority, they go out and they ask for bids on a certain section of the line, and a joint venture will be put together, a contractor and designer. They will say, I will design and build this section of a, of a route for you, and I will charge you 20 million, whatever, whatever the number is. Uh, however, the problem is that if they only get five or maybe even ten miles of rail, then that contains far too few bridges to make it worthwhile to set up a full span precasting yard and to build all of the fancy and very expensive erection equipment to do it. And therefore, none of these, if you like, high level methods which have been used in China, none of those are really going to be possible from an economic point of view. The, eco the economics simply are not there. And so this is some. Um, this is one of the difficulties you get a little reputation, and therefore each of the contractors can be somewhat different. And then on top of that, uh, the governor has decided that he did not want to go through and uh, pay for the whole thing, and therefore the high-speed rail has been <coughs> massively curtailed. So in terms of our project, that kind of derailed us a little bit, and it said, well, you know, is it, does it really make sense to go on and pursue doing some of the things we originally looked at? which really could not deal with the superstructure, they would have to deal with the substructure because the superstructures are pretty much predetermined. And so what we did was to say, well, if we look at the substructures, can we find some feature of them which is going to be consistent also with what is done in the highway business and do something which is useful there? This, of course, will still be useful if they do start up the high-speed rail again. And so the questions really are, um, can we look at these uh, drill shafts and the connection between a drill shaft and the column which goes up to hold the superstructure because these are pretty widely used in both highway construction and they will be used if the California high-speed rail uh, <coughs> takes on its, its uh, full head of steam again. Uh, this fortunately uh, will connect with some of the other projects within PIA and fortunately will connect with other work that we have done in the past. And let me just try and pull you into the world of drill shafts there's a thing, there's a type 1 and a type 2 drill shaft, which tells you nothing whatsoever about what they are. Type 1, though, is a drill shaft where you drill a pile in the ground and you cast the pile, and then you take the column up with the same diameter as the shaft. And those have been the traditional way of doing it, and on the surface of it, that is very sensible. Um, type 2 shafts are bigger than the column, and typically you have about, in feet, uh, about a two foot additional diameter on the shaft compared to what you've got with the column, or maybe a little bit more than that. So you want an eight foot diameter column, you'd have a 10 foot shaft, would be fairly typical. And there are a couple of reasons for doing that. Uh, one is, if the shaft is bigger than the column, then that means that the shaft is presumably stronger than the column. And that if there is an earthquake and you get bending moments and shears in that whole uh, entity, then the the damage is going to happen in the bottom of the column where the ratio of strength uh, to applied <coughs> moment is probably the lowest. That's a good thing because then you can see it, you can inspect it, and conceivably repair it. If you've got to dig down 20 feet underground to even inspect it, let alone repair it, that becomes a much more major operation. So they're good for that. Um, the second thing is that from a construction point of view, this is helpful because if you build the shaft, then 
uh, it's very difficult to dig a 10 foot shaft and get it in the right place within two millimeters. That's a huge job for a drilling company. Uh, you can usually do it within something like three inches out of the way, um, but closer than that, no. If you need your column to be in exactly the right place, and this is particularly true if you're using precast cap beams or cross beams, they have to fit. Um, and therefore, it's important to have the columns in exactly the right place. And therefore, you need high accuracy. If you build the shaft up to nearly up to grade, then you put the column in, you can move the column around a little bit and then position that very precisely before you do the final pull. And I'll show you right now, uh, typically how you build these things. You first of all find some earth, uh, then you dig a hole to put your, your shaft in. You drop a cage in for the shaft. Uh, you then put some concrete in up to some level, which is maybe one or two <coughs> column diameters below grade, something like that. And this next bit is called the transition region. Uh, you then come and put your column cage in. And the beauty of this is that you can move the column cage around a little bit to get its position very precisely wherever you want to. Having done that, you then concrete the transition region. Uh, you then come along and you, you can pull the column and then come in and put a cap beam or a cross beam in and whatever, and you're off and off and running. Now, one of the things that you find with these tattoo shafts is that in the shaft, the bending moment is controlled by conditions a little bit below grade. I'm trying not to trip over the wires here. Uh, but this is a notional uh, bent that you have with the shaft going down here. This is not actually shown in the type 2 because I stole it from another presentation. Uh, but this picture here shows you the bending moments. And we've got fixity up the top here. So we've got a bending moment which is measured off in that direction. And in the vertical direction here, we're measuring vertical height of the column. So at the top, you have the fixed moment here between column and, uh, and cap beam. You come down and you've got a moment down here at grade. But the moment gets bigger in the shaft as you go down here. And the peak moment is somewhere down here, one or two column diameters below grade. If that's true, you have to design the reinforcement in the shaft to deal with that moment. So by the time you get up to grade here, which is the connection with your column, then the shaft will actually be somewhat stronger than it needs to be. And you have a little bit more reinforcement there uh, than you might otherwise have thought that you needed. So what that means then is that at that connection, the bond with the shaft bars is not too big a problem. Because you've got more shaft bars or bigger shaft bars than you really need there. So that part of the bond is probably not a big problem. And the bond is probably going to be critical, if anywhere, in the column bars. So that part of the story then takes you over and says, um, in these type two shafts, you have a particular condition, which is called a non-contact splice. which simply means you're splicing one bar here, and the other one is not tight up against it, but it's over here someplace. Maybe distant, if you've got a 10 foot column, sorry, got an eight foot column and a 10 foot shaft, then in some sense, they're about one, about a foot apart from each other. And a non-contact splice uh, traditionally has been seen as needing to have some, a significant amount of horizontal reinforcement here, tie reinforcement, because you get to draw a strut and tie model with the red struts and the green ties. In Washington, we build peculiar bridges, uh, one class of which is called floating bridges, and they do exhibit a nice test bed for engineers who want to look at them, because when I went to the University of Washington a long time ago, there were four floating bridges in the world, and we had three of them, and the other one was in Norway. Uh, they built another one since then. But if you think about statistics and you like to think that structures fail at the rate of, shall we say, a probability of 10 to the minus 6 per year or something, since I've been there, uh, two out of the three original floating bridges have sunk. And so a failure of 67%, the failure rate, is probably not what the statisticians really like to dream about. Uh, but on the new, one of the parts of the new floating bridge, they're building this type of structure. And the engineers who are designing the shafts have decided that there's normally they put a casing, a steel casing, around the top of the shaft while they're building it to keep the, 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 the mud from falling in. And what they've decided they want to do is to cut off the casing in the top three feet of the shaft. So what they will be doing is removing the wonderful steel spiral that you've got there, because this is like a one inch thick steel tube going around it, and they want to cut it off for appearance sake. And I've been trying to argue with them and say, no, this, this is exactly where the forces are the biggest. And you are removing steel in exactly the place where you want it. Uh, but so far, we have not come to an agreement. 
But my point is that this kind of thing, I believe, is important because in terms of performance-based engineering, if you do have serious damage in the top of the shaft, uh, because you have a, a, a failure of the spiral legs is not strong enough, because you did not take advantage, to, or you did not recognize this non-linear distribution of force, then it could have serious damage consequences. And it appears from previous research that what you really need to do is to stack these spiral reinforcements heavily near the top, and you can afford to taper it as you go down. And this indeed, if you can succeed in doing that, that would mean that you could avoid yielding the top reinforcements, and therefore you could cut down the amount of damage that would happen extensively near the top. So what we're, what we're hoping to do, and we are just starting the project, is to take a closer look at the, the load transfer mechanism in these non-contact splices. We would like to look at both a traditional cast, traditional cast of grace approach, but there's also an approach whereby you can put not just a reinforcing cage at the top, but you could put a whole precast column at the top, and that would speed up the construction a lot. And this is really a reflection of the ABC thinking that is coming in at the beginning of the project. And there are also questions of, could we get better behavior and perhaps pull some of that load transfer further down the column bars if you were to put a head on the column bars rather than relying on traditional bone, and then maybe sleeve the bars apart part of the way to prevent some of that bone from further up. If that would give you a better behaving mechanism, that's something that should indeed be considered. So where we are now <coughs> is uh, we are <coughs> planning to conduct some tests on this. We're now doing a preliminary analysis in order to design those tests. And most of what we're doing is uh, looking at some of the bond characteristics and trying to, try to find out, can we really explain how this non-uniform uh, distribution of bond is happening up and down the bars? And we're doing some bond modeling, and this is the last slide, so I think I've saved the time. Um, we are doing some bond modeling up and down the bars, and some of them have got heads on them, and this is just an example. And what we're looking at here is over the length of the bar, if you have this much slip, then this is the axial stress in the bar at the different places. Big stress at the front end, going down to nothing at the end. And here is the bone stress, which, <coughs> according to these models, uh, looks like it's much higher in the front end, and that's indeed why you get the big bone transfer up there. One of the intriguing things is we ran some, some analyses with a head on the bar and with no head on the bar. And the red one here is the headed one. And the, the blue one here is the, I'm sorry, it's the other way around, we got the, these two are wrong. And the stress in the bar here goes down, and you have a little bit of stress in the headed bar, and then no stress, obviously, in the non-headed bar here. But the headed bar makes almost no difference. The head on the end uh, basically plays no role uh, in, this is a 60-inch bar, and this is a number 18 bar, and so the 60 <coughs> inches is not that long for a number 30, 30 bar diameter from a number 18 bar. So what it's telling you is that if you have a head on the bar and you have the bond all the way up here, the head does almost nothing. So if you really want to force some of the load transfer down here by using a head, you're going to have to sleep the bar. I'm not sure that's necessarily the right solution, but it's certainly one uh, which could, could be considered. So just in terms of planning, uh, we're in the kind of planning process now, and in the spring quarter, uh, in uh, April through June, we're hoping to actually get building specimens and then hoping to test some during the summer. So I think we're just about on time. Thank you very much. I appreciate you.